Hi everyone, welcome to our workshop on tidyverse in R for data analysis and visualization. Yep. Can Sanraj, can you all see Sanraj and Jianhui? Okay, yeah, we can see you. Yep, so we are gonna spend the first few minutes uh, seeing if you have any difficulties with installing R Studio as well as setting up the directory for the workshop. So if you have any difficulties with setting up the R Studio as well as the workshop directory, just send something on the chat so that we can help you. So maybe Sanraj and Jianhui, do you want to give a short introduction and just share about what you are doing right now, um, what you are studying, and um, yeah, maybe you can share about what the workshop is going to be like. Okay, so I'm Sanraj. Uh, I'm a year two student in data science. I, I'm, uh, I like playing computer games. I like uh, having fun. And yeah, I'm the oh, also, and I'm the vice president of Any Statistics Society. Uh, yeah, I guess that's all about me. Uh, hi guys, I'm Jianhui. I'm actually Sanraj's um, course mate. As in, we are the same year, same same course, everything same. That's why yeah. So the things that we will be covering in this um, workshop, right, will be uh, mostly from our previous module. DSA 2101 data visualization. So yeah, we are excited to share about what we have learned. Yeah, so Sanraj and Jianhui, can you share more about um, how Tidyverse can be useful in say perhaps like at work and internships or perhaps your own data science projects? Right, so uh, Tidyverse uh, enables you to like uh, manipulate data frames and basically data wrangling and data visualization. So you can, you have the ability to analyze uh, data sets and you have the ability to make uh, visual plots to show your future employers uh, how, how things work within the data set. And you can also uh, modify the data set to fit into your machine learning models. So R is a, R is a very good uh, language to help you uh, have control over your data set in that sense, yeah. In my opinion, um, Tidyverse, actually Tidyverse is like the most useful library in R, arguably, but I think most people can agree on that. And it's the, it's the library that makes R so popular these days. And I think it's actually, um, Tidyverse is a good place to start your um, data science. Um, because you can start to build on your fundamentals, your understanding of statistics and data science before you actually um, bring more um, varieties of skills in. So um, I guess Tidyverse and R is a very um, good place to start learning data science. Especially if you see um, ggplot2, uh, which is a sub package under Tidyverse, um, it's a library for data visualization, which is basically plotting graphs. And it's built upon um, Ed Edward Hufty's, um principles of best, best practices in visualization, which is, um, which is basically the, yeah, as his name suggests, the best practices um, in plotting graphs. So the whole library was built on that. So it's, um, it's a very good place to start. Um, like learning the fundamentals of data visualization. Sanraj, I think your screen went into <laughs> Okay, so for those who are here or watching already, we are going to spend the next five minutes to uh, 
just see if you have any difficulties with installing R Studio as well as setting up the the work directory. Um, so uh, feel free to send uh, whatever you want on the chat. Uh, uh, to ask about the workshop, to ask about how to install. Maybe you are stuck on some installation step, or maybe there's some error, cryptic error that you don't know how to resolve. Uh, and we will spend the next five minutes, three to five minutes, uh, going through these um, little problems before we begin the workshop. So I'm going to send the, the, the Statistics Society website on the YouTube chat. So if you go to the website, uh, you can, at the top right-hand corner, you can click on workshops and click on using, let me share my screen. So if you go to the homepage, this is what you will see. So if you look at the top right, you can click on using Tidyverse in R, and this is the workshop website. If you scroll down, you can see the YouTube link that is this live stream, as well as um, uh, that is where the recorded version of the YouTube video will be. And you can click on the links to the slides and the pre-workshop installation. So this pre-workshop installation, uh, basically, you just need to install R, install R Studio, and set up the environment for the workshop, which is, uh, con which contains some files that we're going to use for some of the demos that we are going through today. And yeah, the slides are here as well. Uh, that's, so if you have any difficulties with setting up the workshop, just uh, just let us know in the chat. So just to check, um, just uh, to ask you uh, may I know how many of you are from science and how many of you are from computing? If you are from computing, maybe you can say in the chat, hey, I'm computing, I'm, or if you are from science, you can say I'm from science. Sunrise and Jim are from science, I'm from computing. Okay, so I guess I can assume that um, uh, you don't have uh, any difficulties with setting up the workshop resources. So let me begin with introducing. <clears throat> All right, welcome to the workshop on using Dataverse in R for data analysis and visualization. Uh, this uh, workshop is brought to you by NUS Statistics Society. We are going to be called NES Statistics and Data Science Society uh, very soon. This workshop is presented to you by Sanraj and Jian Hui, who are our VP as well as our Director of Events, respectively. So what is NES Statistics Society? We are officially under the NES Department of Statistics and Applied Probability, and we are committed to foster a community of students passionate about statistics, data science and analytics, machine learning and quantitative finance. But we are open to all students of any background, experience and interest. So for the following semester, we will be recruiting again. So do stay connected with us and see what ways we can work together. These are our uh, links, social links. Um, you can keep in touch with us, especially on the Telegram channel. Our Statistics Society website, which you can see here, is where you can find resources of all past workshops, slides, uh, recordings, upcoming workshops for the semester, as well as events, etc. Our tele Telegram chat is where you can talk about all things under the sun, uh, relevant topics, of course. Our Instagram is a place for broadcasting events, memes, and statistical musings. Do check us out there. LinkedIn for serious content. And finally, our email if you'd like to connect and collaborate with us. So this semester, we had a total of three workshops. If you have joined the previous one, you will know. So we had a data science competition where we presented uh, the Applied Computer Vision Workshop. We had recently had the Effective Data Storytelling Workshop. And today, we are having the Using Tidyverse in R Workshop by Sanraj and Tianhui. So to check out uh, the past workshops and the resources, you can check out this link here. All right, welcome to our workshop. Let's begin it finally. Introducing our workshops team, I'm Jet. I'm the director of workshops, and I'm studying computer science. Uh, 
Rama, Agatha, Georgie, and uh, Yi Zhe were, uh, this is Yi Zhe, um, presented for the DSC workshop. And for the data storytelling workshop, um, Michael Ng, Zheng, uh, Zheng Peng, Ming Liang, and Michael Yang presented for the effective data storytelling. For today, uh, Sanraj and Tianhui will be bringing us through the workshop. Sanraj is our VP of Ops and Tianhui is our Director of Events. So without further ado, let me pass the time to Sanraj to start off our workshop today. Okay, I'll share screen. <clears throat> okay, so hi guys. Um, I hope that all of you have uh, downloaded your uh, RStudio and R and and if you have not, uh, you can do so now. Also, once you have downloaded it, I hope that uh, you have to download this thing as well. And it is from the NS Statistics Society, the website. Uh, you just have to go to the folder. Now, once you click on the folder, it will bring you to the Tidyverse uh, Google, uh, Google Drive. And what I need you to do is I need you to right click and download this entire folder. Now this is important because uh, uh, this is how we this is how we be coding. Yeah, everything is inside this folder. So once you have downloaded it in your desired location, um, I'll just I'll just wait for a few minutes so uh, so that uh, for you guys for you guys to download. If you have any questions of where the folder is, uh, you can just let me know. Okay, so I assume that all of you have downloaded this folder and you have stored it in the, your desired location in your computer. So what you do now is you go to, uh, okay, you go to source, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, you go to, uh, you go to, so once you go to the folder, you go to source, then you click, you double click on, or you open DeepIR student you open it with R Studio, okay? So this is important. Uh, please open this uh, link with in R Studio, and uh, it should look like this. It should come up like this. I'll wait for a few seconds. Okay. So if you have any questions, uh, please let the chat know, and I'll and I'll attend to those. Okay. So. When, once you have opened it, uh, let's look at the slides. Now, so in uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through some uh, live coding. So I'll just code on the spot and you guys uh, you guys can copy down the code I'm typing. And don't worry, I'll, I'll share the code with you once everything is over. So in the slide, in the R Studio, once you see these four dashes, it means it's your turn to code. Um, a, a hashtag like this means a comment. So you can just read the comment and a box like this is a new section. Okay. All right, so let's begin. Okay, so I hope that uh, you all have, this is what it looks like for you right now. Okay. Um, if you still can't find uh, this deep liar, you can always go to, for me is on the right side uh, on this right side for me is under, I can see all my files here. So I can locate where I stored the folder and I can go to source and I can click on, and I can click on this and it will come up here. So you can, that's how you can navigate and uh, find the, the script that we're going to code on. All right. Okay, so let's begin. Now, if you have no experience in R, that's fine because uh, I can just teach you the, the simplest of syntax, the, the syntax. And okay, so let's begin proper. Now in R, right, how to run, how to run, uh, okay, let's talk about RStudio. In RStudio, uh, this, this top part for me is the script, okay? So this is where I edit my text. I, I mean, I edit my code and stuff. This is the console. So that I can just, I can, I can do whatever I want here. Now the top right side is the, global environment. So wherever, whenever I store something, 
um, it, will, it will show up in the my environment here. Okay, so that's how that's basically our studio. Now, um, to so in our right, when you have opened this up, the to to run a line in the script, you just have to go to the line, and you have to press Control Enter. Okay, that's that's all. So when you hit Control Enter, uh, it will show up on the right side on the global environment. To run multiple lines, you all you have to do is you have to highlight the tree and hit Control Enter, and you see that on the right side, it has it has it has run. Okay. Now you don't have to worry about the code for now. Uh, I'll explain everything later. Okay. So in now in this in our right, uh, you, you have uh, data structures and you have the not your and you work with vectors. Now a data structure on the top right side is called in my global environment is called DF1. So go ahead and click on DF1. And what you see is uh, a data frame and it looks like this, right? So that's how you, that's how you can observe uh, data structures in R. All you have to do is go to the environment and click on it. If I wanted to see the list, I can click on the list and, and this tells me what, what, can, what is inside the list. So um, inside the list, it tells me uh, I have a list named element A and element B. Uh, there are two things inside this list. Um, and then inside the list in A, it, uh, A stores this and B stores this. So it's a very easy way to visually see what uh, each data structure looks like. Okay. Okay, so another way to view objects. Okay, so this part, see the four dashes. Uh, now you have to start uh, copying what I write, all right? So how to, another way to view, I think is you, have to, you can type view and you can type in df1. And this is another, and you can hit control enter. And this is another way to view objects. Uh, view objects in uh, R, R Studio. Okay, and it's important to code code it up because uh, later on it won't run if you don't run something here. So uh, please copy down the code here. All right. Okay. Now let's move on. Um, now in order to remove something from the environment, because if it clogs up, it's quite annoying. So in order to remove something, what we do is we try RM which stands for remove, and we can do uh, df1. And it, uh, and you can see dfs, the df1 object has been removed, okay? Okay, let's move on. Now, be careful, this comment right here, uh, this comment right here removes everything from the list, everything from the environment. If I run this, you see everything goes away. And um, we uh, use this in, uh, be, be careful when you use this uh, thing. You don't want uh, save things to go away, right? Okay. And also uh, how this works is uh, this LS basically lists down everything in your environment. So say I had V equals to uh, one, B equals to two. And if I did LS, it just lists down all the things in my, in my environment. Okay. And um, that's how uh, this function works. Like I'm removing everything in my in my environment. Okay. Now this is an important part, so please uh, pay close attention. Now I want you to run this line, and when you run this line, uh, you can see where your source is. Uh, this is based, this what this means is called is getting the working directory. Now the working directory, uh, I need you to set it to source. How to do it is there's two methods. One way is you come to the right hand side over here, and I want you to click on where you've saved your folder, where you saved the, the, the folder that we are using currently, the data, extra resources, slides, source. So what you need to do is you go to source, all right? And once you hit source, I need you to go to more and set as working directory over here, all right? And if you want to do it, you will see that uh, your, your working directory has been set as source. All right. Um, there's one more way to do it. And that's how, so you can either go back to the way you saved your folder. Uh, you go to source and then you can find the, 
you can just copy the directory name here, the direction, and, and you can do the same thing, set working directory. Uh, then I can write, uh, okay, so this part you need to put the, uh, the, the characters, the, the apostrophes, and then uh, put, your, put your, the path, the path to your source here. Now, one thing you have to note is that in R, it doesn't recognize backslash like this. So what you need to do is either, you can either change this to a forward slash, or you can change this to two backslashes. And I like to just change it to two backslashes. All right. So I'll just do that. Okay. And, um, and you can see my, if I type in get, get WD again, it will show that my working directory is source. Now, if you did not catch that, please let me know so I can go through this again. Okay. I hope everyone has got it. All right, so I'll be moving on. So now uh, I'm gonna introduce the question mark. The question mark means uh, it tells you what a function does in R. So we were, you were using this remove function just now. And how this works is if I hit, if I hit run, it tells me how the question mark works. Basically, uh, you can read here the description. Remove uh, can be used to remove objects. Uh, these can be specified successively as a character strings or uh, as a character vector in the list. So, and yeah, so and the question mark works for any function in R and, um, and what you need to do is, and you can show how it works here, like what parameters it takes. So uh, it takes in objects, it takes in, you, can, you can take in a list and, and so on. It, it's a very detailed uh, script on what each function does. And then at the bottom, you can see how the, you can see examples, all right? So uh, yeah, okay, let's move on. Okay, in R, there's a particular thing about syntax. Now, if you notice, I don't use question marks that often. When I assign my, when I assign uh, a variable to a not, uh, to something like a vector, um, what I use what I use is this arrow notation, and basically it's, it works just, just as just like the question mark, but uh, but uh, but it's it's preferred to use this. I, I was taught how to use this, so I just kept using this. Okay, wait, I got a chat. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, this equals to sign. Give me a sec, yeah. Okay, so uh, let me just repeat. So this uh, arrow notation is the same as an equal to sign. Um, and it's just to assign something to uh, 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 a variable, okay? So if I run this, you can see it comes on on the right. And, and it's the same thing, it works the same way. So you can hit uh, control, you just run these two lines and yeah, this is a, that's all. Okay, so what I want you to do is I want you to go ahead and create one more uh, vector. Oh, all right, before I, before I move on, uh, one more thing I want to tell you is that this C notation here, this C stands for concatenate and it basically concatenates everything inside this uh, bracket. And what, you're, what I'm creating here is called a vector. Now, uh, inside a vector, you need to supply uh, objects, uh, elements of the same type. So these are integers, and, and these are numeric types, and these are character character uh, objects, basically, character types, basically. So yeah, uh, and and whenever you create a vector, you must always supply uh, this C. Okay, so go ahead and create a few vectors on your own, and uh, please create something because. Uh, because this dash here, it won't, you have to write something here. If you don't want to create anything, you just delete the dash. Yeah. Okay, so I hope that you have created something. And uh, let me just create one more thing. Uh, so I, what I can do is I can concatenate the two vectors like this. All right, so this is the first vector over here, and the second vector, and I can concatenate it. 
and you can see that it has arrived. Uh, it has arrived at the in my environment. Okay, moving on now to data frames. To create a data frame, we use this function called data dot frame. All right, and uh, and data frames are made out of columns, correct? So. Uh, we, let's go ahead and I created two columns here, column one and column two. And you notice that each of these columns are vectors of length three. Okay. Now to create the data frame, what I do is uh, I create, the, I give the name first, followed by the arrow notation, and then followed by data dot frame. And uh, R Studio can help you. It fills up the, the thing. And then you can just type in column one column two, and hit control enter. Oops, sorry, I didn't run this. Oh, uh, before that, I run these two lines, and then uh, hit D and hit this line. So you can see that you created your first data frame, and it looks like this. I hope uh, you guys caught that. Okay. All right, so I'll move on now. Um, give me a sec. Okay. So now I'll talk about the recycling rule in R. In R, right, uh, we rarely use any for loops or while loops or any sort of loops uh, because R is, is vectorized. What this means is that uh, we can run something in a vector without having to use a loop. Uh, basically, a function is able to be applied to every element in a data structure without telling R to use a loop. Okay, so for example, let's run this line. So T1 looks like it's just a vector from one to 10, all right? And if I wanted to add five to each element of T1, what I can do is I can just assign T1 plus five. And I don't have to recreate a for loop and say to R like, oh, for every element I, I add five. I don't have to do that. I can just put plus five here and R knows what I'm doing. And if I, and, and if I show you what it looks like, you can see that every element has been um, added added to five. Every five has been added to every element. So what R is doing is it is taking five, and it, it is recycling it every time until it hits the last element in the vector. So it has recycled the element the the, the same as as the same length of the vector. Uh, let me show you another example. Maybe it'll be more clear. So uh, same thing. Uh, let's create another data frame. Uh, column three, yeah, run this. Okay, now you see column three is of length three. Column four is of length one. And um, now let's create another data frame. So data dot frame, column three comma column four. Okay, if I run this, you can see that 451 has been added, has been recycled three times so, uh, and yeah, it has been repeated three times here. So that is what the recycling rule is doing. It is uh, recycling the value 451 three times and uh, it is creating the data frame using that. Uh, yeah. So that is the beauty of R. You don't have to write uh, many for loops in R. So uh, let me stop here for a while. Are there any questions? Okay, if not, let me clear the environment. Okay, so also you guys can just hit the, hit control enter here. And uh, yeah, if, if, if you run into any, any errors, please uh, let us know also, so I can tend to that. Okay, so now let's go to the fun stuff. Now we'll be talking about tidyverse. Okay, so first thing I need you to do is just hit control enter in DF and uh, it'll come up. You can you should be able to see something like this, okay? And this is an inbuilt iris is an inbuilt data frame in R, so you don't have to uh, ex save it anywhere or anything. It is already inbuilt. So now, for those of you who have used R before, uh, if you have used R before and if you have used uh, tidyverse before, uh, please uh, run this line. But only. But if you have, if this is your first time using tidyverse, which I'm assuming most of you, uh, please run these two lines in uh, simultaneously. Okay, so 
because for me, I have, I have already installed R and I have already installed Tidyverse. I'm going to run this line. If you have not installed Tidyverse, please run this line and this line, uh, 118 and 120. Please run these two. And I'll wait for a second. Uh, I can teach you one more way of installing is you can go to packages and you can hit install uh, on the top right, on the, on the right side. And when you hit install, right, you can just type in, type in tidy verse and you should come in here and um, you can hit install after that, but I won't do it because I already have it. Okay. All right, I assume that all of you have gotten, uh, have installed Tidyverse. Now let's, now let's begin with the, our, our, the Tidyverse commands. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna learn is filtering uh, data frames, okay? So what filter does is it, it selects, uh, it filters rows, so it selects certain rows based on your discretion. And how it works is, uh, first, what you have to do is you have to supply the function filter. Then you have to supply the variable name, I mean, the data, the data frame. And then you have to supply the conditions. And you can supply multiple uh, conditions. Okay, in this example, you can see that I supplied, uh, I only want uh, these rows where it's, where it's versi color. And it has been filtered to this. So this is what I want. Let's see how we can get it. Now, this is a non dplyr array. way. So the non dplyr way is, as you can see, is a bit hard to remember. And the, the thing about tidy, the dplyr is, is very standardized. Um, for one, for filter and the other verbs that I'll be teaching you, uh, they have the same syntax. So you don't have to, uh, you don't have to think, memorize a lot of things. You, it's, very, it's very simple. Whereas in the, this is how I would do it if it, if it was uh, the non dplyr way. And you can run this if you want. And you can see, uh, yeah, like all the versi colors come out. Um, I, I won't go through this code, but uh, if I if you want, I can, I can tell you how that this works. Okay, so for dplyr, um, like I said uh, on the slides, first thing I need is okay. So I wanted the the versi color, I wanted the versi color rows, right? I I want I really want these rows. So the first thing I need to do is type in the the function name, followed by the data frame name, which is in this case df, so df comma. Then what I need to do is I need to specify the column name, which is species. Okay. And species, what I want it to be, I want it to be versi color. All right. And if I run this, it should show up as all versi color. Why don't you guys give it a try and let me know if you have any problem. Sanraj, there's a question on the YouTube chat. Wait, else. give me a sec. Are there supposed to be warnings and conflicts messages? When, uh, yes, that is uh normal. So you can uh, it's 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 okay to, it's okay to have these uh these errors. Uh, there's nothing to be uh. It doesn't need to be concerned about, uh, like like how Chinese said, uh, uh, is due to the similar functions name use because R has multiple functions of the same name, so I think that's why the, these errors pop up. But it shouldn't be. It's not. It's it's not a big too big of a concern. Okay, so let me do one more thing. Say I wanted to filter rows based on multiple conditions, and uh, I want uh, I want the petal length to be um, more than average. And I want it to be versi color. So in order to do that, um, let's do this. So filter df. Now same thing. Species equals to versi color. So this is the first condition. And now the second condition that I want to supply is uh, I want the petal length. Let's look at the data frame. I want this petal length to be more than the average petal petal length. Okay. So same thing. Petal length, which is the the column name, GTH, I want it to be more than the average, which is mean of the petal length and GTH. 
Now, I just you have to just make sure that your spelling is correct because uh, if you if you copy wrongly, uh, R will throw an error. Uh, yeah, okay, it looks fine to me. Um, and let's see that I have my brackets correct. And if I run this, it should work out. Uh, so now what I'm looking at is basically all the rows where petal length is more than the average uh, and the species is versicolor. So that is how filter works. Okay, if there's any questions. Okay, now let's carry on. Now let's go to select. Uh, so what select does is basically, it's quite simple. It just selects a column based on a condition. Uh, in this case, I, let's say I want sepal length and sepal width, these two columns, and I want to, I just want to select these two columns. Now it's the same syntax as before, select, then the data frame variable, then the column name one, column name two, and so on. Uh, note that the column name can also be the column index. Okay, so the indexing means um, one, two, three, four, so on. And uh, okay, let me, let me see, let me show you what I mean. Okay, first, uh, this is the non deprior way to do it. We use a dollar sign to access the column. Uh, there's one more method, but I won't go into that. Uh, but let's let's see how to do it in the deprior. So let's let's write it here in this form. So first thing is uh, select. Okay, then um, yeah. Okay, so select the data frame. Okay, then what I want is I want the sepal length and sepal width. Sepal dot length and sepal width. And it should work. All right. You can see that I only have two columns now. And um, one thing not to notice is that there's no, you don't have to supply any of those uh, uh, these things, the the apostrophes, you can't, apostrophes are the, those, those things, yeah. I forgot the term for it. Uh, yeah, so that's the thing, good thing about DeepIR is that I don't have to, oh, the quote, double quotes, yeah. Yeah, so I don't have to supply the double quotes uh, in, in, in R, in, when I'm using DeepIR because uh, it's just, it's just that good. Whereas in the normal method, uh, this normal method, I have to supply this, this the double quotes. Okay, to access the column menu. All right. Okay, so the next one. Let's say I'm going to select based on the index of the column. Now, if I go back to the data frame, now this column name, this column number is one. If I just hold my cursor here, you can see that it's written column one numeric, column two type numeric, uh, column three, and so on. And in R, indexing starts from one, whereas in Java and Python, uh, indexing starts from zero. So that's one thing to take note of in R. So what I can do is same thing, df, and then just one, two. And uh, you can see that uh, it's the same thing. Okay. And let me move on. Okay, this, uh, I had a question. I'll, go, I'll come back to this question later on. But uh, one question for you is, how do you think we can remove a column using select? Uh, but but I, I haven't really taught you how to remove things yet, so I'll leave this out for now. But let's move on. Okay, mutate. Now, in mutation, I mean mutate, uh, mutate basically either adds a column to the existing data frame or it applies a function to a column, all right? But uh, most of the time, personally, I use mutate to add a new column. Uh, so the, the way to do it is basically same thing, mutate df, then the new column variable is equals to uh, a condition. Now you can either use a, the recycling rule here or you can uh, supply something else. Let me show you what I mean. Okay, so, uh, Let's say I want to create a new column which adds the sepal length and sepal width. Okay, now simply, same thing, mutate. Um, what I want is df. And then uh, uh, now I want to uh, create, an, I, need, I need to create the new variable name. And we should create, give a good, a good uh, 
a good column name. So let's call it Adder, edit sepal. And what I want is I want to add this guy and I want to add this guy together to give me a new column here on the, on the end. All right. So add a sepal is basically sepal dot, uh, what's it called? Sepal dot length sepal dot width. NGTH plus sepal dot width. Okay. And if you run this, oops. Uh, let me just see what I went wrong. I think I got a spelling error. Oh yeah, N. Okay, it should work now. So um, uh, yeah. So what I did was, if I see my data frame now, you can see that I added a new column here, and this new column is the addition of sepal length and sepal width. L five plus font plus three point five will give me eight point six, and so on. Yeah, so that's how mutate works. So for mutate, um, you need to input a vector that is either the same length as the data set or it is of length one. And that is where the recycling length, uh, recycling rule is used. Um, so over here, what I did was I supplied a vector of the same length as a data frame. Whereas over here, uh, let, me, let me show you what I mean as, as of length one. So what I can do is, uh, let me copy this down. Okay, give me a sec, yeah. Okay. I'll go a bit slower. Okay, so, um, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna show you how the recycling rule is used to create a column at the end. And um, so first thing is mutate, and then the DF again. And then followed by column name. Say I want long petals. Now, what I want, what I want is, for example, this is what I want. Uh, in this petal length column, I if a call if the length is more than the average length, I will assign it to be true. If not, I will assign it to be false. And the code for it is using this function called if else. All right, so if else uh, petal dot length and gt8 um, is more than uh, say the mean petal length dot len gth, uh, then, then I'm going to assign it to be true. If not, I will assign. Uh, I'll assign it to be false. Now, this code is a bit tricky to write down. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'll just copy this code and I'll send it to the YouTube chat because uh, it's a bit hard to type out. Okay, give me a sec. So you guys can copy that code down and uh, you guys can run it. Okay, so let me go back to what I was saying. So what I was what I was trying to do is I want to identify long petals. So if else means if my petal length is greater than the average petal length, I'm going to assign the value to be true. If not, I'll assign it to be false. And uh, let's run this. Okay, I think I got a I got an error. Let's say yeah. So uh, let me just re give you the code again. I'm scared I gave you the wrong code. Okay, that should work. I think I missed out a bracket. That's why it's giving an error. Okay, so uh, yeah. So now let's look at the data frame. And you can see that uh, long petals, you can see there's so many false because the petal length is not greater than the average. But you can see there's some trues here. And that is how it works. Yeah, um, I, I hope that I hope you guys caught that. So that is how I'm writing uh, mutate based on a condition. Okay. And if I wanted to say like, uh, say I wanted to use the recycling rule, say df two 
Uh, this one you don't have to copy down. I just wanted to show you like how it works. So df and then say new column, new column is the one. And you see, I'm, I'm supplying a length of one. So, and if you look at the column, you can see it's just one, just full of, full of ones. I didn't have to supply, I didn't have to supply a, the same length as the, uh, the number, as the data frame. So the recycling rule is being applied here, which means that one is being recycled uh, as, as, as long as one is basically, one is basically filling up the, the data set. Yeah, you don't have to copy this line. Uh, you can, uh, it's just for observation. Okay. Okay, now I'll move on to piping. Okay, let's see what piping does. Now, piping is a shortcut key in R, which means that basically what it does is it is sending a data frame before the piping, before the what, so what is what it looks like? It, it is a, it is this uh, percentage more than percentage. This is basically what pipe, what it looks like. So what it says is I'm sending, I'm sending the thing before the pipe to a function after the pipe, and I can repeatedly do this in R. Okay, so let me show you what I mean. So say I wanted to send the data frame. I'm sending this data frame to select. Okay. And once I send it, and it is doing its thing, select is running as a function, and the select output is being sent to filter. And then the, the, fil and the filter output is being sent to mutate. So it is, it, you can just continue on doing this uh, as and when you like. And the shortcut to, to write it fast is a uh, control shift M. Yeah, if you write that, you can see that it'll just come out. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a shortcut to type it. So, oops. Uh, yeah. Okay, so let's run this. And, and, yeah. And the equivalent of doing this, this is the equivalent. Uh, you can see that I'm, I have to rewrite the variable so many times. But whereas over here, I just have to write this, I just have to assign, uh, this entire function to once. Whereas over here, I have to do this first time, then I have to write it again, and then I have to write it again. It is pretty annoying. So this piping thing becomes very handy in R. All right, uh, let's go on to group by. Okay. Uh, I hope that you, have, you guys have no, uh, if, if there's any question, you can let me know. Or if I'm going too fast, uh, I'll try, uh, I'm, I'm trying to slow down. Um, okay, so group by, it's very important, group by. What it does is it groups the data frame based on a categorical variable. Now, the categorical variable means it takes on just a few values. In this case, species, it only has three values, setosa, versicolor, and virginica. And if I group by setos, uh, the species, okay, I'll, I'll slow down. Okay, um, if, I, if I group by species, uh, Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica, this, this entire data frame, oh, uh, this entire data frame is being sent to uh, a, a sub, subset of the data frame in, in essence. So it, this is one group, uh, this is another group, and this is another group. So um, you can see that, uh, like this big data frame has been split into three uh, smaller data frames. So that is what group by is doing, and it is grouping based on the condition, which is. Uh, let me show you the life code. Okay. All right. So let's run this line. Df grouped. Uh, is, is assigned to df, and then I'm going to pipe it. So what I'm doing is I'm sending the data frame to species, okay? I'm just, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm sending the data frame to the function group by, and what I'm grouping by is species. And just know, you just know one thing, uh, I don't have to, I don't have to supply uh, the data frame here again, because the data frame has already been supplied here. Yeah, 
So uh, that's one thing to note in piping. Whenever you're piping, you don't have to rewrite the, the value of the, the data frame here, like how we were doing it early on, because uh, it is already be behind. So R knows that I'm, you, I'm working with this data frame. So, um, so back to group by. So what I'm doing is I'm taking DF and I'm sending it to the group by function and I'm grouping it with using species. So if I do that, um, it doesn't look and it doesn't look like much. It, I think it looks like the same. It looks like the same thing, but uh, let's see how it, it helps. It works with other verbs. Now, one more thing is whenever you uh, use a function on a group by data frame, it is going to be applied within the groups. It is not going to be applied to the entire data frame as a in one continuous fashion. It is going to be applied within the group. Yeah. Uh, it may not seem like much now, but let's see how group by works with summarize. Okay, summarize. Okay, so summarize. Um, what summarize does is basically it applies a function to groups of data frames, to the groups of data frames, or to the whole data frame. In our course, right? I mean, in our workshop right now, I'll be talking about within the groups. So. Uh, let's look at this group data frame. I have three groups here: Setosa, Versicola, and Virginica. These are uh, so summarize basically um, will apply a function within these groups. Now let's say I wanted to find the average petal length within each species of of, of these flowers. Now um, the average petal length will be is, these are five numbers. So I want to I want to find the mean of these five numbers, and this is how it works. Um, summarize uh, the data frame variable, or uh, if in case if you are piping, you don't have to write this. Okay, if you are piping, just remember you don't have to supply the data frame variable name. So summarize. Now, whenever you're using summarize, always remember to supply the a new column name because what you're doing with summarize is essentially you are creating a new column based on the previous columns. All right, and all the other columns that you're using will all be dropped, other than the new column and the group by column that you're using. So I think so. This is what it looks like. Um, uh, as you can see, Setosa was Versicola and Virginica. It has been now there are only three rows, and the and you can see there are only three values. And let's see how it look how to write it. Okay. Give me a sec. Okay. Okay. So, uh, if you if you haven't run this function, uh, do run it. So we'll be working with df grouped. Okay. So df grouped is okay. I'm gonna pipe it now. It means I'm sending df grouped to summarize. Uh, what I did here is just I just shift enter because uh, you can also continue writing here, and uh, you can and you can you can go on it can work, but um, it's it's good practice to keep your code neat and tidy. So uh, always hit shift enter after you do the piping. Okay, so df group I am sending it to summarize. Okay, now like I know in the in the slides I wrote df here. But since I'm piping, I don't have to write it. Okay, so now what I need to supply is, okay, so what I wanted was, I wanted, uh, I wanted to find the average petal length within each, uh, within each species. So the first thing I have to think of is the column name. So average petal length, okay? So this is the column name that I want to assign. And then what I want in the column is basically mean of the group by of the petal length. So this is what I want. And um, one more thing. Uh, so let, let's, let's talk about what's happening here. So the group, so the groups within the groups, I am just averaging the petal length and I'm supplying the output. That is that is all that's happening. And over here, and at the end, you just have to supply. Okay, let me just show you slowly. Uh, you had to hit a comma, then dot groups. 
And what do you do with dot groups? Normally, I will always type drop. Now, this is something standard, standard to write. Uh, this is something uh, to write is standard uh, because what this means is I'm basically dropping the groups that I was working with. And if you use the question mark function, uh, if I type um, summarize, Uh, you can see the groups, right? You can either drop the group, which I always, most of the time I do this, or you can keep the grouping. Or if you group by multiple conditions, say multiple columns and drop last means you drop the last grouping. Uh, and then row wise means you group by each, you group using uh, each, each row is its own group. Yeah, so uh, it's a good practice to always write this after using summarize because R does not know what to do once you have uh, finished using the function because uh, yeah, that's all. Okay, so this is what it looks like. And if you run this, you can see that I managed to achieve three, three rows um, and in, within each row, you have the average petal length. I hope this was uh, clear because this was a bit tricky to understand. Yeah, so let me just, one more time I'll go through this. Uh, this is a grouped data frame and I'm sending and I'm piping it, which means I'm sending it to summarize. And from summarize, I am finding the mean petal length. Okay, so this is a new column name I'm supplying. And within the new column name is equals to the average petal length. Yep. I think this is the hardest part of uh, of uh, tidyverse. I mean, the, I mean the, the verbs because it's a, it's a bit hard to realize it at first. Uh, I mean, it's a bit hard to get the grasp of how summarize works, but uh, we're using groups and summarize together, it, it becomes easier. Okay, last one is arrange. Now arrange basically arranges the rows in increasing or decreasing order. Um, okay, so arrange is, say oh, in this case, you can see that uh, if I want to arrange according to the column, uh, average petal length, you can see it's increasing 1.42, 4.75, 6.56. 6. Say I wanted to reverse this. If I wanted to reverse this like this, uh, arrange can do that for me. And what it takes in is just the column name and that's all. So, but there's two different syntaxes, right? The first one for ascending order is you just have to supply column name. For descending order, you just have to supply uh, DESC in front of the column name. Okay, uh, let's try it down. All right. So um, let's work with the thing. Let's work with this data frame. So F average length, I pipe it. Okay, I pipe it, arrange, which means I'm sending DF arrange to, I'm sending DF average length to this function arrange. And now I need to supply a column name. So, but before that, I need to think, do I want it uh, increasing order or decreasing order? Since this is already in incre increasing order, let's change it to decreasing order. So let's start from 5.52 to go on top, then 4.2 remains and 1.46 to be at the bottom. So what I do is DESC, which stands for descending, and the column name, in this case, is just average petal length. Average petal length. Okay, and if you look at the DF grouped, uh, I think it's this one. Okay, uh, you can see that is it is going in descending order. Yep. Any questions? I know there's a lot to take in in one workshop, but if you go through the recording and you play around with it, I'm pretty sure you can get the hang of it. Okay. Yeah, give me a sec. Okay. Okay, uh, I'm assuming there are no questions. Now I'll, I'll ask you a few questions on how to do, but uh, before that, let's just read in, let's see how to read in a data frame. Uh, I mean, a data, a CSV file, I mean. So if everything worked, if you follow what I was doing earlier on at the start, if you run this line, you should not have any problems running this line. 
and you should be able to see heights, the 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 data frame heights. Okay, I hope if you guys have any problems, uh, just let me know because this is a bit tricky. Because this only works if your source, if your working directory is set correctly. So your working directory needs to be have a source at the end. You need to see this over here. Uh, let's see. I hope you all could read this file. And uh, one more, let me just go through how to how to get set the working directory again to source. What you do is you go to files on your on your this this area of R Studio. You go to files. You locate where you save this uh where you save the data. I mean the the folder. You go to source, and you click more on the top right. You over here. You click more, and you set as working directory. Okay. Once you've done that. You, and if you run this line again, it should work out. If you have uh, any problems, just let me know. Okay. Uh, wait. All right. So um, once you've done that, there's a. I have a few questions for you. You guys, the answer is right here. Like it's just below here. But uh, try not to look at the answers. Uh, I just let's just let, try doing them in say uh, seven to ten minutes, and uh, I'll go through these questions in seven uh, thirty seven three. Okay, yeah. Let's take a ten minute break. Uh, I mean, take a few minutes to do this, and then uh, I'll go through them, and then we move on to part two. Yeah. <sighs> Maybe we can take a five <laughs> minutes break. So we'll resume at uh, 7.35. So in the meantime, uh, just let us know if you have any questions on the chat, um, if you need to catch up to certain parts where Sunraj has gone through previously, uh, do let us know either on chat or on the uh, pigeonhole, which I will send again now. Um, Sanraj, can I ask you, um, what do you think uh, perhaps uh, first timers would uh, find the most difficult about Tidyverse? I think the hardest part about Tidyverse for me personally was actually uh, getting summarized was quite uh, hard for me at first. Like I didn't know how to, what was the purpose of summarize, uh, how it worked. So it, it took me a bit of a while to uh, get to understand through practice how the function summarize worked. And, and in Tidyverse, there are lots of uh, sub-branches. Like you may notice that, I mean, I'm talking about mutate now, but there can also be like mutate at, which is, which is a sub, which is a, another version of mutate. Like it's a, it's a, it's a very, it's a mutated version of mutate. Yeah, so I, I like so there's there's many many different ways you can use the tidyverse uh the tidyverse uh library and especially in deployer um yeah um yeah yeah I see do you use tidyverse in uh your internships or app uh, yeah I I use tidyverse in my I use deployer and ggplot too in my internships in my in my internship and uh, it was quite helpful. Uh, the only problem that I faced was that not many people use R, uh, in, out there, like in the in the so so it was a bit difficult um, getting advice on how to do something better. So that was one of the challenges I had because most people use Python uh, pandas to solve 
to do data analysis. So uh, that's that's the only drawback that I faced using uh, Tidyverse, because not many people use it. So uh, it's hard to if I don't know how to do something, I can't consult anyone other than my professor and my TA. I see. I see. So Tianhui, what are you going to bring us through in the next half of the workshop? Well, I, I think Sarah Shaiwen finished uh, giving the answers, right? So after mm -hmm. that, um, I'll be showing you all, like, how do we, like, after all these data ranking tools that you have learned from Sunrush, like, what's the point? What, 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 what does it end up to be? So we'll see how it, we put it into practice la, and to create an end product. So I'll be covering more towards the end product part which is the data visualization. Um, yeah, so we'll be plotting meaningful graphs, not only meaningful, but also um, graphs that are like informative, attractive, and in general, it follows the best practices that we have learned from, um, from the module. Yeah. Okay. All right, Sunraj, I think uh, any time now, because there's no question ah, okay. for us, whatever, you can respond. All right. Okay, so I'll get back to sharing my screen. Okay, um, let's go to the first question. Filter out, uh, filter out people who are older than the average age. Now, uh, when I think of, when I look at this question, I think about which, uh, uh, which verb I need to use. But, and it's obviously filter, because I said filter. Uh, and then I just look at uh, people who are older than the average age. So I look at this word average. So I, I'm, I, I think of the word function mean, okay? And, and it's simply basically heights. Oops. Uh, uh, it's heights. And then I, I basically pipe it down to the function filter. Then age is basically, and then what, what, what I want the age to be. So let's look at the highest state of it. H is one of the columns, okay? So basically I want the column H to be greater than the average H. And yeah, that is as simple as that. <clears throat> okay, let's go to the second one. Uh, using the filter data frame, uh, use group by, basically using the previous data frame, use group by and summarize to find the maximum height in males and females and label this column as maximum height. Okay, so, but I, so my answer previously was H1. And now basically I take H1, I pipe it to group by. So because I said, uh, I said to um, group it uh, based on males and females. Over here, males and females is under the column sex. So I will group it by group by sex. Then I pipe it again to summarize. Now summarize means <clears throat> I want to find, I want to apply a function. And which means I want to find the maximum height in males and females. And, and I said to uh, label this column as max height. So max height is the new column name, is equals to the max height uh, within, within the group. So what, how you can imagine this is a group of males and a group of females. I'm just locating the tallest person in that group. That is all I'm doing. Yeah, uh, I think, I guess I can just, uh, change the question to find the tallest person amongst the males and females. Yeah, that's another way of asking. And always remember to uh, supply what you want to do with the groups. Most of the time, I just put drop because I don't need, I don't require the groups after, uh, again. Okay, third question, find the average salary for the different races, which means, and then arrange the data frame in decreasing order of salary. So, um, Again, we need to use group group by, and I want to find the average salary of the different races. So that means I must use mean. I, I mean, I must use summarize, okay? And then I said to arrange it, so uh, I must use arrange. So first thing we do is group by race, which means now white is in one group. Okay, let's let's click on this. Okay, actually, yeah, that's a good way. Of, that's one thing to notice. If you click on this column, right, you notice that everything is uh, suddenly all kind of, it's visually appealing. So uh, if you don't like the mixed up rows, you can just click on this and you you can see how it looks, it looks better now. So it's easy for you to visualize. 
and it helps me code also. So, um, so what I'm doing is I'm grouping by race, white, uh, black, and, and all that. Uh, and then I am, uh, I'm finding the average salary, which means I'm using, I need to supply the column name and then I need to uh, assign it to a function, which is mean. And then again, remember to drop the grouping and then I'm uh, arranging based on the average salary, which is here. Now notice one thing is that I am using over here, I'm using a variable that hasn't been declared. It, it appears to have not been declared yet, but R knows or dplyr knows that I am referring to this guy. Because normally in other languages, you always declare the global variable and and uh, and we have to and and um, and stuff like that. But R knows that I am referring to this guy here, even though I haven't formally declared him, declared it yet. So it's cool to write this. Okay. <clears throat> and last but not least, uh, using mutate and the function if else, change the male and female to one and zero respectively. Now this can be useful in machine learning where you need to uh, encode your, your categorical variables or your, your males and females into ones and zeros. In, for some of the models that, we, that you have to use, they only accept uh, numeric, numerical values. So this is useful. Uh, basically, this is, I think, binary encoding, where the heights I'm finding using the function mutate. So sex again. Uh, so I, thought, I told you all that mutate adds a column to the end, but uh, mutate can also apply a function to a column. So in that, ca in that, in that case, we just, the, the name of the column here is, you can just use the same name, and R will know that you are referring to that column. You don't have to supply, yeah. R knows that you're 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 referring to the this sex column. So sex is equals to if else. Now, how if else works is um, if you do question mark if else, you can see that if else takes in a condition. So the first thing you have to put in is a condition. The condition should return a vector of true or false. So sex equals to equals to male means that the vector the, a vector will be returned of true and false. If sex is male, is tr if it if it, if it is true, then um, so if if male or here is the same as male. If it's true, uh, a one will be returned. If not, a zero will be returned. That that is that is all. Yeah, uh, and yeah, and you can see that sex has become one zero one zero one zero one zero one zero and so on. So yeah, I think that's all from my part. Uh, and one more thing I want to add is that now with all these verbs, you uh, you can go and find out cool stuff from data frame uh, from data sets. Like for example, salary. Like you can find out whether the salary between females and males are they different in the real world? Uh, if so, by how much? What is the average salary amongst males and females? So you can you can really go and go to Kaggle.com and find data sets and just just start, just start uh, plotting things up, uh, uh, or like finding out cool information. And uh, yeah, that's what you can do with uh, with uh, Dplyr. So now I'll pass it over to Chen Hui. Yo, hi guys, um, let me share my screen. Yo, I hope you enjoy um, and able to follow Sanraj's part because um, we will be using some tools that we've learned there in our um, coming part. So before I start my part, right, uh, I want to introduce you to this um, useful resource, yeah, um, which is available in the folder that you downloaded under extra resources. There's a ggplot2 cheat sheet here, which will be useful once you get to know how to um, put it in, like how to plug it into like the canvas, which we will we'll be um, introducing later. So um, after you know, you know the syntax, you can um, refer to here to try out new plots anytime you want after the workshop. Yeah, so I'll begin with my part, uh, part two, visualization. So this is um, what I'll be covering, a short um, summary of the contents that I'll be covering. Okay, um, before we start, right, um, I just wanna briefly tell you what makes R and ggplot2 so popular and useful. Um, 
you might know that notice that there are like very ex established and very good libraries in Python, like PyPlot, Matplotlib, um, or Seaborn, which uh, can produce very powerful visualizations as well. But as I mentioned before the workshop, right, um, Tidyverse ggplot2 is um is built based on the best practices of visualization, which is um perfect for beginners in data science. You you do want to learn the um the right concepts before you start to plot more compli complicated stuff. All right. Um. So let's begin formally. Okay. Um. This slide is available in the folder as well, but you can um just refer to this um YouTube. Um, as I as I go go through the workshop. Okay, first before we begin begin plotting graphs, right? I want you to take a look at these two tables, um, which I already labeled as untidy data and tidy data. I want you to try to figure out what's the difference between these two tables. While while you're figuring that out, right? Um, I just want to let you know tidiness is an essential topic in modern data visualization. Whether you're using um Seaborn PyPlot in Python or using ggplot2 in R. Um, like this tidiness is, is very important. The reason being, we can only plot tidy data. Um, in a way, the computer can only understand tidy data. Okay, fortunately, there's a way to convert any type of data into a tidy format. Um, so we'll see what is meant by tidy data. The two tables you see here, right? Actually, they represent the same information, exact same information. There's no information loss at all, but it's just the way that they are presented is different. Like the, the one labeled tidy data here on the right, and you can see that every column, there are three columns there, person, treatment, and results. So um, every column corresponds to exactly one variable, which is what we want. Um, like the first column at, um, represents the person's name. They might be duplicate, but it's fine. The second, um, column, it represents a treatment type, A or B. And the third one, it rep represents the result, the number, right? Whereas the, the one on the left, you can see that um, there are two columns representing the same thing. Treatment A and treatment B basically is the same variable, which is a type of treatment, but it's spread across two columns. So um, what you want, right? What's the definition of tidy data, right? Is to have exactly one variable represented by one column. Every column should um, represent exactly one variable. Okay. Um, also, do note that actually being untidy, the data being untidy is doesn't does not mean does not mean that the format is wrong. In fact, usually untidy data is better for humans to understand. But in order to plot graphs, right, no matter what um platform you're using, we always require a tidy data set before before we can plot it. Okay. So. We will, we will see how to convert an untidy data into its tidy format. Okay, first thing first, um, we have to run this read RDS function to read in this file, which is already in your um, data folder. So RDS is actually um, a data type in R, specific to R, which is stores a pre-created like pre R object. So after you run the code, right, it's in the script already. Oh, yeah. If you haven't noticed, right, there's another script in the SRC, the source folder, ggplot2. Yeah, please open this um this script, like how you did with um the deploy deploy one. Right. So I hope you open it already. You can run the first line here. Um library tidy was I you, you already um, run so you can skip that and come to the slide four. UN um, you assign this RDS file into UN. So let's take a look of what is UN. So UN is a data frame. Um, it's actually a United Nations record of how many tuberculosis cases are, are there in each country here. And actually a more um, a better way to look at data frames right is to run hit UN, which um, lets you see the first six columns, uh, I mean six rows of the um, data frame. Okay, so I think at this point, right, I hope you realize that um, the UN file, uh, the, I mean the UN data frame is not a tidy data. You see, six years spread over six columns. So 
we'll see what we can do about that. Okay, so um, in order to convert the untidy data, which is this one, where all the six years are spread across six columns, we have to run this pivot longer function. This pivot longer function is um, kind of easy to understand. Okay, first thing first, you pass in, okay, you type in, okay, I, it's already in your screen. So you pass in the name of the data frame, which is UN here, and the columns that are repeat, I mean like untidy, the untidy columns, the columns that are spread across six other, like six columns. So here I say the year 2010 here, and then this, this symbol here, it represents until, until year 20, 2015, right? Remember the double quotes here? Because this is not exactly a dplur function, so you need the double quotes. Okay, now um, I'll, I'll just run this function and let you see what's the result first. Hit UN2. Okay, you can see, right? Now all the six columns, they are now merged into one column called year. This year, this year column, right? It comes from here. I give it the name year. Names two, I give it the name year. And what about the numbers here? All the numbers. I give it another name, cases, which is because um, it's actually the number of tuberculosis cases. So um, in the end, the function will come out like this. Um, the year and the cases with, and the names that you give it. And the six columns are now merged into one column here. And the numbers will be um, placed under another column, right? Okay, so now let's check whether this is a tidy, tidy format. The first one is the country name, Japan, Vietnam, Nepal. The second one is gender. The third one is age group. Then year, cases. We can notice all these five columns, right? They represent exactly one call, I mean, one variable, which satisfy our definition for tidy data. So um, we, this, this um, data frame is ready for us to um, to plot later on. So do remember to run this because we'll be using this um, data frame um, later. Okay. Okay, so a little task for you before we move on. Um, using the data rendering tools that you've learned from Sunrush in the first part, get a subset of UN2. UN2, which is um, this one, this thing we created, that satisfy the following. Okay, I want only um, columns, I mean rows. I want only rows with um, of female data and people from zero to four years old. And it has only um, data from Vietnam. Um, here's a hint, filter the rows. And then you later you save it as uh, Viet, right? So I'll give you um, one or two minutes. Um, please try it out. Um, okay, you can replace the stars here, the four stars here, um, to create the data frame. Remember, um, I want you to filter it out to females, zero to four years old, and data from Vietnam. Three requirements. Meanwhile, I'll check the YouTube chat. All right. Ten more seconds. I'm actually not sure that's enough. Um, okay, I think let me just give you the answer. Okay, so um, first thing we need the um, need to filter, right? So the filter verb, you end to as the data frame. And I'll pass in the first thing is I want um, gender to be female. Right, then um, I want age group, the zero to four years old. And lastly, I want um, all the information from Vietnam. 
EF name. The country column is called EF name here. Um, notice that indentation is not important in R, so you can indent as you like to make uh, um, your code tidy. Right, EF name, Vietnam. Let's try this. Oh, wait, okay. Remember to put, put double, double equal signs. Basics of programming. Right, let's take a look at our data frame. It seems like our data frame has no columns here. Um, that's why you should always check whether you have filtered them correctly. If we take a look at the data frame, right, let's see UN2. Actually, you see the F name, the country name for Vietnam is spelled differently from what we, we would have expected. So um, we will need to spell it exactly like how it, it is in the data frame. So yeah, let's change the code. Okay, this should work now. Let's take a look. Right, so now we got six columns here, I mean six rows here. From Vietnam, um, gender female, and age group zero to four years old. So all these six are come from different, the six different years. So later we can see how, how it changes over the years. Okay. Um, I hope you got that, the, the weird data frame because we will use it later. Okay, now um, we are ready to plot, but first let's see how um, plotting in tidyverse works. For modern visualization tools, right, especially ggplot2 in R, all the elements in the graph are added one by one, layer by layer. So um, the top red box here, right, it shows you the general syntax of ggplot2. It seems, it seems very um, complicated here, but later we'll add them one by one, so it will be very easy to learn. It consists of four lines here, and each line corresponds to a different layer. So basically, right, we are adding layers on top of layers into the graph. Like, okay, in the script here, we have prepared you uh, prepare six lines of layers. So um, you show okay for at, at this point, right? You don't have to understand what this code do, but then um, you can try to run it and see what happens. Okay, let's try with the first layer. Um, like you should control enter. So once you run the ggplot one, right, you see an empty, empty thing here appear all of a sudden. This, uh, this is actually the canvas which we will add things on. So this is the very basic layer which is required in every graph. So I'll, I'll start with ggplot. I'll pass in the data, right? So in order to add the second layer, the geom line layer here, we put a plus sign here, okay? And then we... Um, continue running the control enter. Okay, this is our first, first plot, like the our first layer on top of the canvas. So as you can see, right, um, this axis, um, axis, the line and the labels are added by this jump line layer. Okay. Okay, let's try adding more layers. Just add a plus sign, then you control enter. Okay, so this third line, right, this layer, it actually switched the, the axis from the bottom to the top. Um, sometimes you might um, have a good reason to do that, although here we don't, but I just want to show you that um, we can add layers by layers to modify the plot. Okay, let's add another layer. Okay, this one changes the coordinate, the aspect ratio. All right, let's add more. Okay, so the fifth layer, we added a a text here. So um like in our plots we can we can like um add text in the in the middle to like um indicate some special special points or whatever so that um the users can understand it understand the significance of that point. Okay let's add the last last layer put a plus sign and then control enter okay so you should have noticed that there's a new title, a subtitle here, and then a caption here. Uh, I think that's all. Okay, X, I changed the name and the Y cases. So this last layer is the labels layer, right? 
Okay, so at this point, you don't have to understand the code yet. Um, you just have to understand that um, every port that we're gonna make, we are gonna add layers layers to to the previous layers, right? Okay. Okay. So um, based on what I've mentioned just now, um, you should you should be able to understand that which which lines here, which line corresponds to which part of the plot, right? Okay, before we move on to the code, let's, uh, I'll give you a little more brief visualization theories that you must understand. Um, please keep in mind that creating a visualization, right, consists of three main parts, at least to me, it consists of three parts. First, the tools, Okay, second, the statistical knowledge, and thirdly, the good practices of visualization. Over this workshop, you only have time to cover the tools part, which is the ggplot, which allows you to produce graphics from data, bringing lives to your to the numbers in a sense. Um, however, that does not make your, make your plot or your data visualization um, good or even meaningful, All right? So I will try to explain a few important practices in data visualization. Okay, the first thing, uh, perhaps the most important of them all, is to avoid redundant representations. Um, in this next slides, right, I've included two terrible plots in the left graphic here. Um, notice what it's doing. It's actually basically only give you one information, which is the which is that male takes up 60% of this class. Actually, you do not even need a whole chart to tell this information. You can just um, like convey the information with one number, 0 0.6 or 60%. You see here, um, the male one, we are plotting a bar for the male one, we color it, then we're plotting another bar for the female one, then we color it again. Then um, these two adds up to 100%, which is what we already know. This is like very redundant, All right? So please do not do this. The plots on the right, right? We, uh, we have a similar mistake, but maybe less severe. Let me check, check for one. Right. Um, okay. Um, it has a similar mistake. So the redundant colors here, which is which gives us no additional information. Actually, the type of cut, the type of cut here, you can really see from the x-axis. Either is fair or good. So what's the point of adding this um, legend on the right to um, like adding a new, adding colors, um, then adding another legend on top of that? Uh, also, you notice that there are values on top of each bar, 100, um, 1,600 and 4,900. So this is very redundant actually, because you can refer to the, um, like the rough, value on the y-axis. And if you wish to convey the exact value, right, you might as well just report the two values, these two um, numbers. If you want to compare the differences between these two bars, then you, you should left, leave out the numbers. So um, to let the bars do the work, okay? So these are two redundant um, plots with very a lot of redundant elements. So just a rule of thumb for you, if an element does not convey additional information, please do not add it. Like the numbers here, like the colors here, please do not add redundant information. Okay, second rule. Um, try to add text description at interesting points in your graph. Um, it could be an outlier, a turning point, or the first occurrence of something important. So, um, but do remember you do not, you, you try not to explain something that's already obvious. You, the point of um, uh, adding a text description in your plot, right, is to help others notice that point, right? If they already notice it, there's no point of adding text, right? Okay, we have um, the third rule. Avoid using legends whenever possible. This might come at a surprise to many of you, um, but by this, I do not mean that you should leave elements of your graph unexplained. Rather, um, you should avoid to making the reader keep referring um, to the legends to understand the plot. Your plot should be self-explanatory 
as much as possible and try not to make them um, refer, keep referring to the legend. Okay, um, I think we have an example for that. Um, okay, so the plot on the left, right, is a, is a bad plot, while the one on the right is the improved one. Okay, you can see that each line each line on the on the left, right, it actually corresponds to one country. But the thing is, if you just look at the plot, you won't be able to tell which country it is. You have to keep referring to the um, to the legend on the right. Like uh, if I say if I see this orange color lines looks um, interesting, they have to refer to the legend to see that it um, belongs to the United States. While in the improved plot, the the country name is put at the right end of the line. So in, in a way, we are integrating the description into the plot, right? Okay, the fourth, fourth point is to allow comparisons. Um, the point of graphs and generally statistics, right, is to make comparisons that, that are able to, that humans mind, um, that's intuitive to human minds, okay? Your graph should be prompting the viewers to make comparisons and prompting them to think about um, the information convey, right? Okay. And the last one, do not blindly try to make your graph interesting. Um, you should try to make your plot, plot informative instead of interesting. But I guess you'll be fine um, if you follow the first rule, which is to avoid redundant data in. Do not add elements that does not give new information. Okay, uh, we'll take a look at a few examples of graphs. Okay, this one on the left. Um, do you think it's a good or a bad graph? Um, right, actually it's a, quite a bad graph. Lah, because you see the third, third dimension, right? It's a 3D bar plot, but what's the point of the third dimension? It doesn't represent anything. And in general, right, um, never try to plot a 3D graph. It's not very intuitive to human minds when it's shown on a 2D surface like the computer screen. So, um, and a lot of time the third dimension, people left it um, like redundant it, without, without any information. So if there's no additional information, do not add the third dimension, right? There are other problems with this plot also. Um, you should, uh, maybe you can, you can take a look after the workshop. Okay, um, as for this plot on the right, this, uh, um, maybe you want to try to try to see whether this is um, good or bad plot. Okay, actually this one is um, quite of a, in a, on the middle, on the fence. Just like, they are, they are some very um, informative um, information here. Like we, we add the average, the average in the, in the plot. Um, which we, we also have the median, the upper quantile, the lower quantile, and the maximum minimum points, and also the um, the individual points. But do note that this this um, added added text right, it could be redundant depending on your objective or the plot. So you do have to um, make your plot. Um, you you try to meet your objectives with your plot. So there are some points here which might be redundant. Like maybe we do not need the individual data points. Maybe we do not need the average um, text, the, the information here. So yeah, there's, um, that one you can, you can think, think more about that after, after the workshop. Okay, this is another plot. This actually is a quite a good plot um, because in very simple lines, right, we are able to convey a lot of information. This is actually the um, time that defenders spend on the opposite half during the FIFA 20, I think it's 2020. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so these are the countries. The country's name are um, put to the, to the end of the, of the graph uh, on the lines. So which is good. We, we avoided using a um, legend. And the red ones indicate that they play more aggressively during um, knockout stage, while the blue ones um, tend to play less aggressively during the knockout stage. I mean, less offensively. So um, this is a very informative plot. There's a lot of information you can um, find in it. 
and you can make a lot of comparisons like how Spain is playing the most um, offensive for both both the stages, right? So it allows you to make a lot of comparisons, which is a uh, which makes it a good graph. Okay. Um, okay, so we are finally going to plot something. Okay. Um, let me check the chat. Okay, nothing. Right. Okay. Um, in this first data that we're going to plot, right, I'm going to introduce two geometric objects, a line and a text, um, which is basically what we've seen earlier, but now we are going to plot it. And also we are do this faceting, uh, which is to produce subplots within a plot. Okay, you see, um, you see how it is later. Okay, if you go to the next slide, right, here is the final code that I arrived at. But at this point, we should, uh, Please do not copy this whole code and run it because you'll learn nothing out of that. So this code is for your future reference after the workshop. Um, in our workshop, we are going to start from scratch, right? Okay. Okay. Um, do remember before we start, right? You need a tidy data for plotting. So we'll use UN2, which we converted into tidy data just now, right? Okay. Of course, the first thing, right, is to prepare the canvas layer. Here I use the piping, but you can also do the data equals to UN2 thing. It is the same. It will be the same effect. Okay, so now it's time to code it out. Okay, Jom line, right? Um, as you might have noticed at this point, actually it refers to the line plot, okay? So we're gonna start with a very basic plot. So um, first you'll, you have to key in this aesthetic function, AES, and then brackets. This is called the aesthetic function. Um, it is the first, first um, argument you should put in the JOM, any, any JOM function, okay? Okay, so in this aesthetic layer, you can tell, it, uh, tell him what to plot. Okay, maybe I want the X axis to be the year, and the Y axis to be the number of cases. Okay, so x axis will be here and y axis will be number of cases. Let's try to run this. Okay, um, we are able to plot something, but it's obviously not what we want. Okay, um, so let me introduce a new aesthetic called group. This is specific for line plots, and what it does is that every group you put right, it will be a different. Um, a different line. Okay. Let's at this point let's put it as the country name and run it. Okay. Since we have three countries, right? Um, Vietnam, Japan, and Nepal. So there will be three lines appearing. This is a bit better, but still not what we want because why why the zigzag, right? Okay, let's see why is that happening. Because um for every country, right? For every year. We have we have actually a few values, say J Japan um 2010 and Japan 2010. Like because the first one is for um I think zero to four years old, and the second one is for the five to nine years old. So there are multiple points at each year. So we're gonna solve this problem. Okay. Um what we're gonna do is we try to plot um for a specific age group and a specific um our uh, gender first okay so here we're gonna filter out the unnecessary ones i only want to keep um let's say gender is female and age group is zero to four years okay remember to add the piping function um here so that we can pipe this this whole data frame into the into the ggplot canvas. Okay, let's try to run this. Okay, finally we get some straight lines, some um meaningful lines, I guess. But the problem is that we only plotting this for females um at the age of zero to four years old. What if we want to represent more information in our plot? Okay, then we might not want to filter out the information. Let's say I want to add the um, the information of gender inside our plot. 
So I won't be filtering out, filtering it out. So I take it out. So now both the genders, um, females and males, will be remaining in the um, data frame. Okay. So we are gonna add a new layer. Um, put a plus sign. Remember here we use plus sign, but in Deepler we use um the piping piping um sign. In ggplot we use plus sign because we are adding layers. Okay, think it as adding adding some layer. Okay, this is a new function called facet grid. Facet grid. Um, at this point you just follow my syntax. Um, dot tilde gender. Okay, you will understand why is it so later. Okay. Um, facet grid. Dot tilde gender. Okay, now you can see that the gender, right, um, is split into different subplots, female on one plot and male on the other plot. So you're now able to make some uh, very basic comparisons. Okay, what if I want more information? Like I want the, all the age group, not only zero to four years old. So, okay, for the first thing is I won't be filtering this out. I want all the age groups to remain in the data frame before I plot, okay? Okay. Now I replace this dot with age group. So at, um, you should realize that the dot actually means nothing. Okay, it's a placeholder there. So when we run this code, we are now able to see the age group um, separated by as rows, like um, zero to four years old on top top two row um, top row, and five to nine years old on the bottom row. So basically, right. Um, on the left of this tilde, it will be the vertical separation. And on the right, it will be horizontal separation. Okay, depends on how you think about it. Um, so we are able to add, add two new dimensions to our plot, age group and gender. So we are now able to compare between different age groups, between different gender, and across six years in different countries. Okay, I guess there's now around six, six dimensions in our plot. Um, that's right. Okay. And actually we can do better. Okay, notice that although although it's split by country, right? Every every line is a different country, but in this plot, can you tell which one is which country? Obviously cannot, right? Because we lack of something which is the labels. Okay, so we are gonna start um start on a new line. We gonna name it labels. We're gonna create the labels, okay? So what we're going to do, we want the um, country name to appear on the right end of the lines, okay? So where, where am I going to get the country names? Of course, from the data frame, right, UN2. Okay, I'm going to first filter out the information from the, from the um, latest year. Y2015. Okay. So this data frame, um, this labels data frame, right, um, consists of only information of the year 2015. Why do we want to do that? Because um, we want to plot the, we, want, we need the values at the 2015 so that we can plot it on the rightmost end, right? Okay. So this thing, okay, remember to run it, uh, run it before you continue, okay? Store it as labels, okay. Now we are going to add um, a new layer to our plot. We recall that this is our plot. Okay, so we are going to add a new layer here called the geom text, which is what we are going to use to add our labels. Okay, let me put a plus sign here just in case I forget later. Okay, as usual, for any geom function, you'll start with the aesthetic function. Okay. Um, here we have to um, do some modification, which is the data. Because we are not going to use a UN2 data, we are going to use labels instead. Okay. So outside of aesthetic, the second argument put data as labels. Okay, inside aesthetic, right? Um, in for this plot, I have to follow the x-axis and y-axis. So x will be year, and y will be cases. Okay, now what about the text, the labels? So in the aesthetic, you put label, 
equals to the name of the country. I hope that's intuitive to you. The X and Y just follow the plot that we, we did. Okay, and then we, instead of using group, group is for lines, we add a label. Label is text for the EF name, the country name, right? And the data, we use the labels data which we created here. Okay, let's try to run this. Okay, you see now we uh, we have a label graph. Um, some minor improvements can be done, like maybe we wanna move the move the name um to the right by a little bit. Okay, let's let's um add some in some information here. Like okay, after the data data argument, right? Uh, I want you to add a new argument called nudge x. This is basically, okay, wait, spelling, nudge x. Okay, basically we are trying to move the labels to the, to the right by default, okay? If you put a positive value, it will be moving the labels to the right. Okay, now there's no overlap, right? But some problem is that now the name is out of the, out of the plot, right? Okay, so we add a layer to, to make the plot bigger, to extend the plot in a way, um, called co coordinate Cartesian. Coordinate Cartesian. Okay, and then we tell it the x limit. What is the x range of x that we are gonna put equals to? Okay, use a vector. Right? Um, okay, this is the first point. This is the um, last point. Okay. Wait, why do you use one and seven here? Okay, because the x-axis is a discrete discrete um, axis, right? Um, so the first first category here will be one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Seven, although there's nothing, but we decided to include it here. So that's why it, it, it creates more space on the right, okay? So this is how you make coordinate Cartesian, and that is how you created your first meaningful plot in ggplot2. Um, I hope that was fun. It was fun for me, but let's see if you have any questions. Okay, if, if there's nothing, right, we are gonna go to the second plot. Okay, actually this plot looks quite nice, um, quite a lot of information. And you can make some minor modifications when you are, uh, maybe after this um, workshop, right? Okay, so the next one will be our second plot. We are gonna introduce two, two other very important jumps, jump point and jump smooth. Jump point is basically um, scatter plot and jump smooth is a, is a regression model, which is done automatically for us. Okay, so this is the, as usual, this is the final code. Uh, let's do it from scratch, okay? Okay, for this, we are gonna use the MPG data. MPG is already in Tidyverse, so you don't have to import anything. Okay. You can just type MPG and see, um, see the data right there. Okay, so we as usual, we pass it into the canvas, MPG into ggplot2, ggplot, and then um, jump point. For every jump, the first thing to do is add aesthetic. Okay, let's say, right, we want to plot um, x equals to hwy and y equals to cty. HWY is actually the highway efficiency and CTY is a city, city efficiency. Let's see how it looks like. Okay, it's a scatter plot as we expected. Okay, you can see that actually the scatter plot is quite um, arranged nicely, right? It's quite tidy, too tidy to be true, right? Actually, because um, there will be rounding errors, so everything will be rounded to, uh, to fix a specific grid, okay? So in order to see how many, like there might be overlap, overlapping points that um, that in any of these um, points, but we can't see how many overlaps are there. So what we're gonna do is that we add a new argument called position equals to cheater. Okay, um, this is actually adding some random error to your plot, okay? We're adding some random noise so this, by this we can, we, we are able to see where, where do the points cluster out, okay? Which is useful when you have a lot of data 
possibly some something are overlapping. Okay, okay, we can add a new information to our plot. Okay, like inside the aesthetic um function, inside aesthetic ah, uh, add this color equals to let's say class. Class is a okay, class is a column in in our data. Okay, so let's see what happens. Okay, now right, all the different classes is get it gets mapped to a different color. So we can now compare um the the scatter the, the points between different classes, like two seater. Uh, maybe the SUV is mostly um clustering here, and the others are uh, maybe more spread out, whatever. So um an alternative to this, right? You might want to do a facet grid as what we have learned. Thought tilde class. It gives you um the same information. So you do not have to do both at the same time, but I'm just doing it here for your info. Okay. So different classes get um map to a different subplot here. So for this demonstration, we just keep it out. We just use the color. Okay. Of course we can only we, we can also um use um, other things like shape to replace the color. So now, right, different classes get mapped into different shapes. Okay. Uh, we can also map both at the same time if you want, but we, that is redundant. Okay. So um, let's do something useful. Let's take away the shape. Um, this is our original plot. Um, now I'm trying to understand the displacement column. I think it's displacement. Yeah. So I'll add a new aesthetic inside the aesthetic function called the size, which, which is actually the size of the points. Size equals to displacement and hit run. Okay. And you can see that, um, Different displacement values, right, gets mapped into different different sizes. Like um, the bigger the displacement value, the bigger the size. So although this is more information, but it looks very cluttered and a lot of overlapping. So what I'll do is that okay, what I'll do is that I'll set the transparency to half the value so that we can see all the points. Okay. Okay, do note that this thing, since we are applying it to all the all the points, right? We do not do it inside aesthetic function, okay? We add the third um third argument called alpha equals to 0 0.5, which means that we are halving the transparency. Okay, now we are able to see uh, more points. Okay, at this point you might be wondering why are we sometimes adding um arguments into the aesthetic function and sometimes outside. Um, a general idea is that if you are trying to add a new information, a new column, you add it inside aesthetic, like HWY is a column, CTY is a column, class is a column, displacement is a column. But if you are trying to do some um, modifications to all the points, right, you do it outside the aesthetic, okay, like the next argument. Like the second argument is cheater, um, position equals to cheater, the third one is um, the alpha. So these two um, arguments, right, it applies to all the points. That's why you do it outside aesthetic. Aesthetic is for you adding new columns into your information, into your plot. Okay. Okay. And, and um, and anytime if you want to uh, see more about the function, like what what is possible, you uh, okay. You, you can run the question mark as Sanraj has um explained earlier. This is the jump point um, function. Scroll down and see the aesthetics here. We have used X, Y, color, and shape, and size as well. Okay, these are aesthetics that you can you can um, put inside the aesthetic function. All right. Outside the aesthetic function, I think it's said um, it's not really um, covered here. But you can also try this this way um, these arguments outside the aesthetic. Just to try it out, okay. 
So at any point, if you want to explore more, um, do read the documentation. It will be very helpful. Um, just to show you if I what what happens if I apply something to something to all the points, but I put it inside as thirty. Um, wait. Okay, what it does is right. Um, if you if I put the alpha equals to half inside the aesthetic function, right, it appears a new um legend, which is zero point five alpha. Basically, all the points here, um, they are mapped to zero point five, which gives no information. It's actually okay. It's actually a very stupid thing. You do not have to understand this actually, but just know that if you want to do something. Um, and apply it to all the in um all the all the points. Do it outside the aesthetic function. Okay. All right. Okay. Um. Just to let you see what are some more attributes that we can add. Um. Say we want to size. We want to increase the size of the um points. All the points. I can put it here. Uh, maybe I want to change the shape of all the points. I can put it here. Okay, shapes we use um numbers. Okay, um why is that? I'm not really sure why we use numbers, but um I think for to un to see the shape right, you have to read read it up online. But yes, um different shapes in R in tidyverse is um encoded with different numbers. So fifteen is this square. Okay. So now we are able to, we we managed to change the um size of the points and the shape of the points to all the points. So we do it outside the aesthetic function. Okay, now we can add something inform informative to our plot. Um, this is very interesting. You see, our plot is somehow follows a linear increasing trend, right? So let's see um whether um. Let's see how a regression line looks on it. So you can add a new layer called Geom Smooth and try to run it. Okay, or uh, okay, I forgot the aesthetics, of course. X equals to it should be Y, Y equals to C T Y. Just follow the axis. Okay, it's still running. Yes. Um. Yep. Um. This uh, lowest line, L O E S S. This is the default line um plotted by Geom Smooth. But you can okay, it says here method equals lowest, right? So this is a statistical um, um concept of how how they plot this line. Okay. So if you want it want to be a linear mo want it to be a linear model, you might want to change the model equals L M. Okay, since this thing you are applying to the whole plot, right? You do it outside the aesthetic. Model equals to LM. Um, plots a linear model. Okay. Why is it? Method. Okay, method, not model. Okay, now you get a linear model, a linear regression, which I think fits better um, to our plot. So we are almost there already. We are almost getting a quite a good plot. Um, one thing is that you should never leave a plot unlabeled. So I add a new um, new layer called labs. Labs is uh, basically the label function, right? So um, let me just give it a title. Title will be the biggest um, biggest text in the in the plot. Say city mouse vs highway mouse. Okay, um, I'll give it I'll, I'll change the name of the x axis also, the label of x, um, highway mouse per gallon. Okay. The y equals to city mouse per gallon. And I'll give it a subtitle, which is something below the title later. Um, by class because we are we are coloring the information by class right so let's run this 
Okay, you see the titles and the subtitle, the Y axis and the X axis is now properly labeled. Uh, in this case, we have to keep the legend, no choice because um, we can't like label them in the in the plot right for points. Okay, um, in case you're wondering how I know that the X is a highway miles per gallon and Y is city miles per gallon, right? You can always run question mark MPG. It works even for the data frame, okay? This is the information for the whole data frame. Okay, so um, I hope you got it. I hope you find it interesting as well. Um, because of the time constraint, I'm going to go on um, pretty fast. Okay, these are the main jumps that um, you should go and explore. Jump point and jump line, um, we have explained earlier. Jump bar and histogram is a uh, um, very important statistical plots which you need to know. Um, do explore it. If you don't know, um, if you need help, you can use the question mark or you can see the cheat sheet or search for the information online. Here are some um, information, uh, some code given for you to try. And these are some other jobs that um, you might want to try. This is a job name, point, jitter, histogram. Okay, okay. Um, before we head on to the optional practice questions, right? I'm gonna give you a few useful layers that you might want to add to your plots. If you want to expand or zoom the axis, we have said uh, we have used it just now. Add a co coordinate Cartesian and then the range here. Okay, if you want to flip x and y axis, like um, say y axis on the horizontal axis and x on the vertical axis, you use a coordinate flip. You just add it to your existing plot, okay? Because it's a it's a new layer. You just add it. Okay, if you want to change the aspect ratio, use coordinate fix. Title and labels, you know already. Annotate with text. So this one you can tell the um you can you can plot you can add some labels into your plot anywhere you want with given the coordinates. Okay. If you want to transform the y-axis into log log scale, you can use um this layer also. Of course, there are a lot of other layers that is impossible to cover. Um, but if you want to know, you can search online. Um, there are very um good documentations and forums and articles on the tidyverse, tidyverse functions. Okay, so before we end um, the workshop, um, I would like to give you a practice question. Um, here are four questions. Um, it should be already in your slide. Please open up the slide if you haven't. So these four questions, right, it follows, follows through, okay? So um, you have to read in the data, you convert it to tidy data if it's necessary. Read the hints. The third one is that you filter out the songs according to this information, and you plot the graph that looks like the one I plotted here. And this one after the workshop, you might want to know how. Uh, you might want to think how can you improve the plot. Of course, I will. I will also give you a uh, an improved plot for you to explore. So I think because we are over time now, this is kind of optional for you to try it out, but I think you'll be very interesting and you'll learn a lot, especially on the extra part. So I'll give you five minutes to try out these um, four questions. Do as much as you can. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, I'll, I'll be looking at the chat. Please open up your slide if you haven't, because I'm gonna um, switch to another window. Okay, we're going to continue at 8.40, okay? Okay, um, unfortunately, due to time constraint, it's better for me to, like, call it um, now. Okay. So, the first thing is to read in the data, read in b, b -bots .rds. okay? So it's a RDS file. Um, so if we read RDS, the path, okay?
um, do remember to make it a relative path because the data is under the data folder. Okay, let's take a look at DF. Okay, um, it's here. So convey it to tidy data. Um, pivot longer. Okay, pivot longer. Um, obviously it's the weeks, right? Um, okay, it's from week one to week 27. So the columns will be week one to week 27. Um, names to week and values to um, rank. Okay. Okay, the second. Okay, where is it? The second one is to um, add these two arguments. You know what? Let me um, use the answer. Um, due to time constraint, I better just show you the answer. Okay, I'll be sending in the answer to you later. Okay, so this is what I plotted. Um, I do pivot longer to make it a tiny data, names to week, values to rank, and the name prefix. Um, this some um, additional um, additional arguments I have already included in the hints. You can just you can just um, add it in, and then you figure figure out what happens. I mean, what what's the effect later? Okay. Then I filter out the artist. I only want crit and DMX. Okay. So now we'll try to plot the graph. We we'll plot a line graph. Line graph. Yes, again. Oh, wait, okay. Okay, so this is the graph that um, I've shown you at the fourth question. So this is how you plot the graph. Okay, so when you uh, after the workshop, you can take a look at what what I did here. Group, how do I color it? Okay, and some improvements. Um, labels, of course, label the line, and this will be the improvement that I've made. Okay, so I changed the theme. Okay, so you can you can try to identify which line did I change the theme. I uh, which line did I flip the whole axis over, and uh, which line did I add the labels, etc. All this will be given to you later um, after, for um, by email, right? Um, so I guess that's it. If you have any questions, you can stay back to us. Um, I'll be answering it here. If you don't have, um, thanks for joining us. Uh, I'll pass back the time to um, Jet. All right, thanks, Tianhui. Let me share my screen. Uh, can you all see my screen? Okay. All right, so thank you so much, Sanraj and Jianhui for the Tidyverse workshop. So uh, once again, uh, this is the last workshop this semester and there are past workshops as well. If you're interested, you can uh, learn more about it in the website here. Um, so the, web, the, the video recording for this workshop it's already available in the website, so you can just uh, go to the society website. You scroll down here, then you can just click play over here. Once again, uh, thank you so much. Uh, please help us uh, fill in the feedback form for our workshops so that we know how we can improve. 
So having been organizing this workshop since uh, way back in winter break in December, uh, we hope that you have learned some useful knowledge about data visualization and uh, uh, analysis in high levels in R. So do shout out your thanks to Sanraj and Jianhui perhaps in the feedback form. And we hope you, has, you have had as much fun as we had uh, organizing this workshop. So we hope to see you again in our next series of workshops. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to send in the pigeonhole or on the YouTube chat and we will remain here for a couple of minutes. Okay, I think uh, I think that there are no questions uh, from the looks of the chat and the pigeon hole. So I think we can end off here. Thank you so much for participating in our workshop and we look forward to see you again next year or next semester, next academic year. See you.